Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. Um, right, I think most of what I'm going to say, apart from the end bit, has already been talked about yesterday and today. So um, I'd be able to skip through this quite quickly. So, so Erwin, um, from our industrial partner, is going to tell you really about the nitty-gritty of this project. Um, I'm just setting the scene, really. Um, so, uh, killed vaccines, you've heard Tim talk today, you heard Pascal talk yesterday, um, and this is usually slides I would use for a, um, a non-specialist audience. So I don't think I really need to say much about that. Um, it's live virus inactivated, more downstream processing required to produce vaccines for, for DIVA. Um, <clears throat> key messages there. Uh, there's a massive shortfall in the availability of vaccines, striking in Africa and Southeast Asia. These, these are headlines. You could talk about each one of these points for, for, for hours, I expect. Um, as, as has already been mentioned, high disease containment facilities are required to produce the current vaccine. They're expensive to build, maintain, uh, because of the high initial costs and ongoing costs. Um, and and this, is, this is something that the, the third point down is something that we really uh, uh, strongly believe in is that um, we, you really need that intact um, uh, shell of the virus, the capsid of the virus. That's either inactivated virus or virus-like particles or constructs that express the, 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 um, the, 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 the capsid. Uh, uh, individual proteins and peptides I don't think have been shown to be uh, sufficiently immunogenic f to be used as vaccine antigen. Um, for, this is very much what Tim talked about, is that the current vaccines are fragile structures um, and, and there's benefit in increasing the stability of them. And then the other challenge is, is new strains, adapting new strains to tissue culture. And then, as you heard, some, some strains fall apart when they're shown BEI, for example. So you know all of this. Um, just, just a, a ma a vac I don't think any of the vaccine manufacturers are going to tell me how much it costs to build one of their facilities. Um, but the, these are the two new facilities we've got at Purbright. So the top one is our high containment <coughs> facility that, that will... Um, house FMDV um, safely. Um, and then the bottom one is our new uh, Jenna facility, vaccine development facility, um, which is a, a CL2 containment. They both house roughly the same number of scientists. The top one cost 130 million to build, the, 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 the bottom one 25 million, and then the ongoing running costs, uh, both in power, both in biosecurity staff, both in engineers, there's a huge difference. So I think, I think the idea of Having a vaccine that doesn't need containment, um, it would be hugely beneficial in, in terms of uh, producing enough vaccine for, to meet, meet the, uh, the global supply. And if you, if you think, well, you could have five of the small buildings, or the lower buildings, for the, the cost of the, the high containment building. So, so we're very much driven by, by getting a vaccine platform that, was, that could be used out of high containment. And the, the other, just a bit of a scattergun, unfortunately, way of putting the talk together, but trying to keep to time, is um, uh, there are a number of reports on how to um, get improved control of FMDV in endemic settings, but I, I particularly, I think this is a, 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 quite a very well-written report um, uh, that, that done by the group in, in at the RVC and, and, and scientists in, in, in Tanzania, and looking at the, at the various things you need to provide to get a commodity-based trade value chain approach to producing FMDV safe beef, um, for export markets, etc. And, and there's, there's a whole series of recommendations, but, but one thing they highlight is that currently the FMDV vaccines that are available in Tanzania um, for, for, for this region in Tanzania are expensive, but also difficult to access. So the concept that if you, want to, if you want to establish an FMDV control program, that's very difficult to do unless you've got an assured supply of vaccine. So it's that, that, that assured supply of vaccine is, is, is absolutely key. And that's where having facilities that at low containment, um, uh, you, you, they're, they're quicker to build um, uh, and, and easier to maintain, but also they're not a dedicated facility. Um, and so... Uh, if, if you know, we've chosen the baculovirus platform, so so in, in theory, if you move to this um, this uh, FMDV vaccines in baculovirus, you could produce that in in any of your facilities that are using that baculovirus. Could be producing circovirus one day, and you could be producing FMDV the next day. So it, that 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 um, uh, adaptability of facilities is is tremendously valuable too. Um, I think I've already said most of this already. Novel vi vaccine platforms, there's been a number of ideas, synthetic peptides, empty capsids, 
various uh, carriers, recombinant adenovirus, which you'll hear later, plant vaccines, um, and nucleic acid-based vaccines. And I, and I think the... <laughs> All right, shall I try shout? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I won't try shouting. All right, so back to what I was saying. I think you need that, 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 that intact uh, uh, virus capsid in order to stimulate a protective immune response. Okay, so this is what that intact capsid, this is based on the crystal structure sold by Dave Stewart and his group um, uh, back in the late 80s. And, uh, and I, I wasn't going to run this video, but... I'm not going to run this video. Oh, yes, it is. So, so um, the, the important thing is that um, but you need to stabilize that structure. And of course, it, there's a tendency for it want to disassemble into, into individual pentamers. So we can find ways of, um, lose my voice now, find ways of stabilizing that structure. And, and we published some work that we could do that in, in, uh, in live virus. The trouble is you have to disconnect the, um, if you're going to sta really stabilize that structure, you have to disconnect it from the virus life cycle because the virus needs to disassemble to release its genome. And so we, we found that if we really found way, if we really stabilize the virus, then it, it grew very poorly. So, so we need to find another way of expressing those capsids other than through uh, live virus infection if you really want to stabilize those capsids. Um, so the, the system we, we developed. Um, uh, is, is, uh, is this uh, way of modulating the 3C protease activity. 3C protease is, is cytotoxic, uh, and, and so by using two strategies, um, we, we downregulated the, the enzyme activity by introducing that point mutation, but also put in a frame shift, in, in this case it was from HIV, to downregulate the translation of the 3C protease. So those combination of, of, of control measures um, we could get uh, processing of the, of the P12A and, uh, <clears throat> and then capsids um, assemble. Um, the other thing that, that's really important, I mean, the stability is important for all the reasons that Tim said, both in terms of antigen potency, um, uh, more tolerant to, tolerant, tolerant to the breaks in the, oh gosh, that bad, is it? <laughs> in, the, in, the, uh, in the cold chain. Um, but what we're finding is that you know, we took, and again, Tim did, did this really nicely, is, is cost of goods. So cost of goods is yield of capsid per mill of, of, of culture fluid um, or, or in the bioreactor. And we seem to be able to express enough protein, but assembled protein, be that it never does assemble or does assemble and falls apart. So those stabilizing mutations are also key for... Oh, that's nothing to do with me. ...are also key um, for... Um, for increasing the yields, getting the yields up to what would be a, a commercial levels of productivity. Um, duration of immunity, so these are, these are uh, VLPs. Uh, we did listen to Tim and we did a, a prime and boost at, at, at three weeks and we got duration of immunity to up to about nine months and, and, and the animals are still protected um, at, at that nine months date. So, um, with a, with a realistic quantity uh, of antigen. And Owen's going to, this is with an A serotype, um, but Owen's going to tell you a bit more about uh, the, the work we've done with other serotypes. So that just leaves me, uh, the, the justification for, for, um, for, for going down this route of, uh, of, of using non-infectious material uh, and, uh, and, and stabilizing those capsids and, and using the, the bacular virus expression system. We've been together, actually, um, for 12 years now, Oxford, Purbright, and, and Reading, uh, and Diamonds linked with, with Oxford. And, uh, and we now have, uh, very grateful, we have our commercial partner, Erwin, who's going to give the rest of the talk. Uh, thank you, Brian. So my presentation is another one. So if you can put that on, please.
It's always weird to see yourself. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the pointer. Um, Brian already showed you a very nice video of, uh, of the structure and I just want to put it on here again, not a video, but just this providing protection in the animal. But upon storage, um, the, the, the capsid falls apart. And with live virus or inactivated virus that we use as a vaccine, the negatively charged RNA genome holds together the capsid, at least that's what has been thought. Uh, but when you kind of produce empty capsids, you don't have that gluing factor of the RNA molecule. So we and others already realized that if you want to make empty capsids, you have to do something. And that's what Brian already said. You have to stabilize the capsids. So not only for storage reasons, also for expression reasons. So um, one way to look at this is, uh, for instance, the VP2 uh, uh, surface, interaction surface, that we can zoom in here and you see there's no physical connection between the two VP2 uh, uh, proteins. But with cysteine bridges or electrostatic interactions, these are just examples, but there are many other ways to stabilize capsids. You can um, um, stabilize them. And we realized that once you stabilize them, you can produce them. So for many strains, we saw that wild type capsids cannot be produced. They just fall apart the moment you, you make them. So um, another thing that we did uh, besides the uh, mutations and the stabilization is uh, improving the yields because we realized that if we want to have affordable vaccines, especially when we have multivalent vaccines, including many antigens, we have to increase the yield. So uh, one way is very straightforward. It's just to optimize the baculovirus expression system. The other way is uh, stabilization again. So the stronger the capsids are, the more you retain them and keep them in your baculus virus expression system. And by combining these things, we got a yield imp improvement of up to 100 fold from the start of the project to where we are today. So by combining this yield improvement and the stabilization of the capsids, we could produce capsids for all four relevant serotypes. So I know there are a few more, but these were in the project so far. Um, the capsids are not on scale completely and they are different staining techniques, but I hope you can appreciate that uh, for AO, AZ1 and Z2, uh, we could uh, get stable capsids. And especially for Z2, as we all know, they are very uh, fragile. Uh, this was uh, a very uh, good result. We were happy with this. So, of course, uh, the most important thing is, uh, are these uh, capsids protective? And we did a few cattle trials in high containment, challenge experiments to, to show that uh, indeed they are. So we didn't do true PD50 trials. Uh, so this is just uh, groups of five, six animals. And we did head-to-head -head comparison of the classic antigen and the uh, stabilized capsid. So for O, for A, for AZ1, and for Z2. Um, the Z2 protection trial is uh, scheduled. <laughs> Uh, but we got very good uh, uh, antibody titers, so I'm quite confident that we will have a yes here as well. So in terms of induction of the antitis and protection, um, it all looks very good. And uh, the amount of capsids we added to the VLP uh, vaccine was uh, at a similar level of the, of the, 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 the current um, uh, vaccine. So it's not that we overdosed anything here. Low battery, no. So it, 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 looked, uh, it looks very promising. So um, uh, we can develop a, a VLP-based vaccine. And there are many th things you have to consider when you're going to develop a vaccine. Uh, I have highlighted a few here. So uh, we need cell and virus seeds. And e extraneous agent testing has to be done, upstream and downstream processing. Uh, a lot of animal trials to demonstrate safety and efficacy, stability of the vaccine upon storage, batch release, potency tests, uh, product registration. And I've highlight, highlighted here two of them, and I will uh, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, those two aspects. 
So the first aspect is uh, large-scale production. Uh, Beclovar's expression is, is actually a very simple uh, way of producing antigens and, and it has been done for a very uh, uh, successful uh, vaccine, um, uh, the, the circovirus vaccines. They, most of them are produced in the Beclovar's expression system at large scale, uh, a couple of thousand liter scale. So you start with insect cells, you infect them at a certain cell density with the recombinant Beclovaruses. After some days of incubation, uh, capsids are produced, you harvest the culture. Of course, you have to inactivate the uh, recombinant uh, Beclovaruses, otherwise you have a genetically modified uh, vaccine. Um, so that's, that's an important step. Uh, and then it's, it's, um, it's a common practice to concentrate, so you are able to store antigen and also you need to concentrate to make the multivalent vaccines, like, like for instance now with the, the classic conventional ones. So this is uh, how it works. And if we look at the product profile, um, many things are probably going to be the same. So comparing virus-like particles with conventional vaccines. Of course, we need multi-strain formulations. Uh, storage temperatures will probably be the same. Uh, although uh, we expect that for the stabilized capsids, we have prolonged uh, shelf lives. Um, DIVA, yes. In the case of the conventional vaccines, uh, purification has to be done to remove the NSPs, but we don't have NSP, so by default, our vaccine is then already a marker. Um, an important aspect here is also the response to new outbreaks. Uh, we know that for conventional vaccines, we have to uh, uh, adapt the um, uh, strains to BHK cells. And uh, you can be lucky and it goes fast, but you can be very unlucky and it can take months or years. Uh, with the new platform, you just need a sequence from the field. It's just the expression cassette you put in the back of our expression system and you can produce antigen. Of course, uh, on paper that looks easy, but uh, we have already noticed that uh, there is also a strain-to-strain -strain difference in expression yields also in the Beclovirus expression system. So, but I, I expect this, this will be much faster anyhow. Uh, production in uh, low containment, well, for the new platform, yes, for the conventional, no. So this has an, uh, a cost uh, uh, reduction aspect. And batch release. So currently, uh, all vaccine batches are released by uh, cattle potency tests. Um, this takes time. Um, and, and cost money. Um, so with a new platform, we, we can also look into alternatives for this one, uh, for this potency test, and that's uh, on, my, on the next slide. So currently, if you have a three-way vaccine with, with an AO and AJ1 strain with certain micrograms of antigen, uh, you, you need to uh, inject cattle. And for every antigen, you do have to do a, a virus neutralization test. And the Vientitis have to be above a certain level. Um, but this has to be done in high containment. So there's still a need for high containment. And on, on top of this, uh, you need strains that are adapted to cell culture again. So it slows you down. So if we would be able to have an in vitro potency test, it would be cheaper, it would be quicker it ful fulfills the three R principles of replacement, reduction, and refinement of animal use. There will be less variation because animals always give us variations. So sometimes you have to, to, to drain a, a good vaccine uh, uh, because of variation you get uh, by accident low vientitis. So that, that's, that's a problem. And as I said, no need for uh, high containment. But this is not so straightforward. Uh, an in vitro potency test need to be able to differentiate between the intact and the, uh, uh, the building, block, uh, building blocks because only the intact capsids are protective. Um, and it has to differentiate between uh, serotypes. So in a, in a multivalent vaccine where you have AO and AZ1, for instance, you want to know in time that the payload stays the same uh, uh, while you st store your vaccine. 
So there are, there are many options I already described in literature. Um, could be HPLC, could be ELISA, could be anything else. And, and this is an example of, of um, what it could be that you have the intact capsids diluted in an ELISA plate and, you, and, and um, the same sample is heated. So you have only the pentamers. And there's a, a nice, there's a nice uh, discrimination between one and the other. So that's where, where we uh, were looking into. So in summary, I, I hope to convince you that uh, um, virus like particles is, a, is a, a, an interesting alternative uh, for the conventional vaccines. They can be produced in this easy baclovirus expression system. Uh, we could uh, increase this, the stability and the yield of the capsids. Um, and we have done that for four different serotypes. Um, and I, I, I pointed out the fact that if we want to max maximize the benefit of this system, we also need to think about uh, in vitro potency test. And well, with that, I want to thank you for your attention.